Th thank you, Camilla. Thank you, Michael. Um, it's an honor to be here and present this, uh, my presentation about um, 25 years of thinking and working. Um, before I start, I, I would like to ask a simple question, which is how many of you are here because you want to understand uh, the nature of development, or how many are here who might want to do something about it just as an entrepreneur or something? I, I want to get a sense of where you are coming from. Both. What? Both? 50-50? Yeah? <laughs> OK. So where is my presentation? OK. Because I do want to um, present it as, because I struggle to understand what leads to progress, or what is known as development. Uh, but maybe many people want to simply do something without understanding, okay? So I, so I hope you don't get a little bit bored if I am trying to delve into what, what actually leads to progress. How can I have broken up my talk into six pieces, just so that, and after all, I have to fill up an hour. So I felt I could do that. First, I will introduce myself through one of my students, through his work, who uh, I created a center at MIT, where, of course, with the help of other leaders of MIT, um, whereby we train students to create ventures in developing countries. And after about training 200 such students, I have moved on to do other things. And then I have the overall lecture. I broke up into three themes, three lessons in my own life and struggles that uh, kind of will help you understand and explain what I've been doing. And of course, there's the creation of Grameen Phone is one of them, and how digital technologies are spreading, uh, how they're changing other industries, <clears throat> and why I think digital technologies can be pivotal in turning poor countries forward. And finally, perhaps what governments should do. So here is a little video, I think two, three minutes, on one of my students. So um, during the last 10 years, we trained students like this who have gone out and trying to create such ventures. Of course, he's one of the better ones. So you see it. Not all of them have gone that far. But frankly, there are some 20 or 30 companies are coming out like this, out of our center. Now, if, before I start, as I said, uh, I, before I start my talk, I would like to go through three themes uh, that I have gleaned over m the years. And actually, I will go through two of these themes or lessons. And uh, then I'll talk about Grameen Phone. And then I'll bring the third theme. The <clears throat> around 1975, uh, I was, I think, I was 17 years old. I moved from a small town in Bangladesh to go to Dhaka because I simply decided to go to the United States to study. And, but the facilities to go there didn't quite exist in that small town. So I went to the central town and tried to find out how to go to America. But once I got there in Dhaka, I realized that not all the good universities in America were in its central city, Washington, DC. So this was a little surprising to a 17-year-old, that how come in our country, where vast majority of things were in Dhaka, and in America, these schools are all dispersed, the universities. So it was striking to me. And uh, so, for instance, you see in the United States, the colleges and universities all over the country. And from then on, I started connecting this thing, that concentration of resources, because I knew I was from the, one of the poorest countries, and the United States is one of the richest countries. So I said concentration of things in one place might mean some kind of regress and dispersion is some kind of progress. I mean, this has been in my mind all along. And then, let's say, about 30 years ago, when the Soviet Union was collapsing, it's rejuvenated that thinking. That here is a concentrated state 
trying to run everything, and it was collapsing because, after all, it represented concentration resources in, in one structure as opposed to dispersed. So what I'm trying to say, dispersion is good and concentration is possibly bad. And again, I'm leaving out my themes at the bottom of each page to help you connect of all the issues I, I wish to express. And then if you look at history of Western progress, it's also various technological tools allowed people to stand up on their feet economically. And that was the foundation of progress. This happened in the last thousand years places like in Denmark. And that too was a means of dispersion of economic resources. And this is, of course, well documented in many books, including, let's say, this one, where the <coughs> David Landis wrote a book on wealth and poverty of nations, that how tools made people empowered economically, and that led to more um, dispersion then again, concentrate. In fact, they were able to have checks and balances with authorities, and that led to progress. And similarly, e economic, you know, people who founded economics, they also pretty much said the same thing. And <clears throat> here, for example, Adam Smith said, there is a desire to better one's conditions. A human being is trying to improve his life. That itself is the most important force of progress. And I, in the 90s, I lived in New York City uh, trying to be an investment banker. And I also noticed poor people coming from Bangladesh and working in New York City as a taxi driver or as a, uh, let's say, vendor of fruits and vegetables, whatever. And what is interesting to me was that the rich world was saying, we need to help out those poor people in Bangladesh and elsewhere. Still, poor people are coming here against many odds, crossing the ocean, far from needing to, rescue, to be rescued by somebody. They're actually courageous people, smelling a little bit of opportunity somewhere, and just coming without knowing even the United States. So to me, this was the, this was the Adam Smith's point in action right in front of me that people are trying to improve their own conditions. Not necessarily they need to be rescued by others. And in fact, they were coming against many odds, often uninvited. So I also saw another phenomena, which is dispersion of computing going on right in front of me. Because mainframe computers used to be big computers, but the same computing power was now beating, being squeezed into small desktop computers or laptops. And that's also a massive force of dispersion. And that, what was going on? Something called the Moore's Law, which means every 18 months or so, computing power goes into, becomes half the price. The net effect, he said something, I think, more complicated, but it basically meant, every, let's say, if something cost $2, 18 months later, it would cost $1. But <clears throat> this means, if every 18 months something becomes half, then every three years, it becomes one quarter. Every six years, it becomes one over 16. Every 12 years, one over 256. So every 15 years or so, $1,000 become $1. And that, that processing power, kind of the brain power of computers, is a massive resource that's dispersing because it's getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, and therefore it could go to a large number of people. So not only dispersion of economic resources is an important point of observation of what led to progress, I frankly saw the feasibility of making it happen, that it could be done right now because of a technological force is in play. It's dispersing the power of processing out there. 
So that's my first observation, and I'll come back to it. And why is this relevant in this talk? The second is that more connectivity, the better. And this is where <coughs> I actually became a fan of Adam Smith. And I know people think he promoted capitalism and this and that, laissez-faire and all that. Actually, he didn't. It, his, his message was far more subtle and complicated. Most of us don't actually know because it's hard to read a big book like that written nearly 250 years ago. But one thing that noticed I got you know, I, it drew my attention, was that he actually talked about Bangladesh. That's why I originally looked into it. Because he said that in the, <clears throat> the historically, in the great antiquity, he saw three places had great opulence in his language. And one of them was Egypt, another was Bengal. Two thirds of Bengal is Bangladesh. The one third is still West Bengal in India. The two-thirds is Bangladesh, which is the East Bengal. And he said, he kind of speculated it's because of inland navigation, because of rivers and things like that, and in, and in China, Eastern China. So in particular, on Bangladesh, after he talks a little bit about Egypt, he said the improvements in agriculture, and this is, by the way, is true. In many other books, you'll be surprised. People see Bangladesh as a very poor country. It wasn't always so. And that is another thing to be understood. What takes countries forward and what takes them backward? So the improvements in agriculture and manufacture seem like Egypt, because he talked about Egypt the previous paragraph, to have been a very great antiquity in the provinces of Bengal, in East Indies, and some of the eastern provinces of China. In Bengal, the Ganges and several other giant rivers form a great number of navigable canals in the same manner as Nile does in Egypt. <coughs> Again, I don't want to waste too much time, but these things drew my attention to Adam Smith. And I'm also trying to explain, as Camilla said, that before other people did, and a lot of people threw me out of their offices, thought I was crazy, I lost some hair, whatever it is, but I saw certain things on the insights of very powerful insights of some people. So I thought I was just setting them in motion than just acting crazily. So I just want you to see what I actually went through a uh, little bit, the thinking. So Adam Smith's world, Wealth of Nations, actually he was looking for ways that would give rise to universal opulence. Universal opulence, okay? To, which <coughs> extends itself to the lowest ranks of people. I cannot imagine a better development concept than that, okay? He was looking for ways. What would give rise to opulence at the bottom of the world, okay? This is taken from his book. So, <clears throat> so that's why I said, ah, oh, this is the right thing to read, okay? And I will also want to show you that in that little thing I showed about Bengal, he talked about inland combo navigation, which is basically communication. Because you could navigate, go from one place to another relatively easily. And he was basically saying, of course there were no cell phones at the time, or even phones, or other kinds of modern communication devices. But wherever naturally, um, the nature has given some kind of ease of communication, they did better. And that's, an inland navigation was more interesting than seas because more rudimentary boats could handle them. So that's why you see the earliest time of progress in the inland navigation. So I kept that in my mind, that communication is important. But in 1993, I, something happened in my office. I was, um, I was uh, working with my colleagues and we used to have, we used to exchange floppy disk from one computer to another. Many of you are very young, you may not know what is a floppy disk. There used to be such a thing in the computers. You would take data from one person to another person. And, but it became easier when we were connected by wire. We didn't have to go through that cumbersome process. 
And one time, that wire network broke down. And somebody, I was waiting for somebody to come and fix it. And as I did, I remembered a day in 1971 when I was 13 years old, and my country was going through a war. And uh, we were in a remote village, and my mother had sent me to get some medicine for a younger sibling. So I walked like 10 kilometers in the morning. When I got there, the medicine man wasn't there, so I walked all afternoon back. So it was an unproductive day. <laughs> but, but when I was having one unproductive day in New York, I said, you know, connections enable, and disconnection disables, OK? So connectivity is productivity. Let's see if we can do something about that. That's what kind of clicked in me. And of course, as a budding investment bankers, I knew that, like what I said, that mainframe is becoming laptops or desktops. And that, too, is being squeezed into cell phones, which is just another computer. And I knew this process going on. So I said, you know, if Moore's Law which says $1,000 worth of microchips become $1 15 years later, then it prices could be going down. And connectivity is productivity. Therefore, it might be applicable even in the poorest countries. So, <clears throat> but let me, before I go further, again, I'm into the more connectivity is better theme right now, as you can see at the bottom of each page. Now. Most of us are pretty content hearing the division of labor that Adam Smith said is a good, cool thing through which people become more productive. So for example, let's say I'm a fisherman and farmer, and just a generalist, not specialized. And Camilla is a fisherman and farmer. Allow me to make you one. <laughs> okay. Then suppose Camilla becomes a fisherman, fisherwoman, and I am, remain a farmer then we can focus on each other, each activity is better, and we produce more. Not new technology, nothing really. Okay. Of course, the process of specializing might lead to new technologies. But just plain specialization can lead to greater prosperity. That's his basic point. And we are often content with that, that that's a, that's a good enough thing. Okay. But actually, he meant there are quite a few other things that come out of the so-called division of labor. And I just want you to see that. Then I'll come back to connectivity. So here, for example, Smith says that people have a propensity to truck, barter, and exchange one thing for another. This is a famous statement. And then he says this leads to and, and reciprocates is the division of labor from which so many advantages are derived. What are those so many advantages? Actually, there are many. Okay. And I want to go through that a little bit. And what they are, are that there is a higher productivity, which we recognize. Okay. But there is also greater cooperation. Because now, Camilla and I have to cooperate. Okay. And also, it leads to better understanding. Oh, Camilla might need more fish or more, more rice, whatever. I have to think about that. Okay. And finally, greater inclusivity, that it makes an inclusive economy. Because after all, today in the development world, we're talking about how financial inclusion or some other kinds of inclusion. But actually, Adam Smith thought about it a long time ago. And I just want to show you how. How is inclusivity working out? So here, let's take a little example. Let's say year one, Adam is not yet specialized. He does five tasks, A, B, C, D, E, OK? And then he, at the same time, Beth, Kathy, David, and Eric are unemployed. Adam is doing everything, OK? Now, next year, year two, now specialized, Adam focuses on A, and then Adam seeds B to Beth, C to Kathy, D to David, and E to Eric. Otherwise, he cannot focus. But by doing that, he has made included everybody else in the economy. Isn't that cool? My point is that by specializing, by focusing on something, you're forced to give away things to others. 
It's an inclusive economy. Adam Smith was the most inclusive thinker of all time. So it's not just higher productivity, but also how he's forced to, not because he cares about all those guys, all those four people, but as he's specializing, he's necessarily giving away other things to other people. Again, it's just a model. But you see that, right? OK, so now, <clears throat> but that's from the producer's point of view, that we have to give away things to others. But let's say from the consumer's point of view, if we, are, we have more producers because we have included everybody else, then in effect, we have more, we have more consumers, right? The increased number of consumers, the greater need to accommodate varied needs and other tastes. And therefore, there's a greater division of labor. So as you give away to others, their thoughts and everything else comes into play. And of course, as you're doing this and giving to others, only the, those who are better at B, they take B. Those who are better at C, they take C. That all this happens. So you can see if the process could work out, then all sorts of other things happen. Not only the society as a whole is producing more, but that everybody else gets involved. And as everybody else gets involved, all their purchasing power goes up, and therefore they can buy other stuff from other people. It's a really an expanding little mesh that is doing the, the, this, this division of labor. Now, and through these, he saw universal opulence emerging. This is the basic model. This is why he thought the division of labor can extend itself to the lowest ranks of people. Because as I'm seeding things, I must in allow other people to take on some of those bits that I'm giving up. Now, so then there's another interesting thing. He said that division of labor is not just strives to include the bottom, but the bottom is also a bigger part of the market. This is, in today's language, called the bottom of the pyramid. But he actually saw it. There's hardly anything he didn't see, by the way. But the point is that he said the consumption of the lower part of the pyramid is much bigger and better. Now, so this is all going on. But now let's come back to the communication thing. Most importantly, this is my language, most importantly. Then he's saying that the division of labor must always be limited by the extent of the market. How big is the market? If the market is tiny, bit small, then you can't really have too much division of labor. And he goes in his own language. When the market is small, no person can have any encouragement to dedicate himself to entirely to one type of activity because he's now not specialized. He's doing everything. But as the market expands, he's, he can focus not just fishing, but maybe I can further focus on just salmon. Because now the market is so big that I can not only, I can focus on a specific fish, maybe a specific size, because the market is big enough for me to do that. Now, if that's therefore what happens, now what is the size of the market? How far you can connect? If I can connect through some other means, river, or a highway, or a cell phone, or whatever it is, if I don't have to just walk over to my neighbor, I can connect bigger, then the market is bigger, then the specialization is more extensive, and all those things that come out of specialization then takes place. This is why connections are so important. And we intuitively know it. That's why this is the main insight of why when the cell phone came about, the price is falling down, and it is so fundamentally useful, even without understanding it, we do it. So let's say when you're eating an apple, you don't know all the chemicals and bio biochemistry of an apple. You don't know how, it is, how it's working out. But it tastes good. You live longer. And you eat another apple. So what I'm saying is intuitively we have been doing it 
without really understanding the complexity of it. But Adam Smith actually thought through it without knowing cell phones. So what I was doing, on one hand, I knew Gordon Moore's law that these things are coming down in price. And I also knew that this is going to work out because it is an intuitively necessary thing. And I was basing my thing on these fundamental, I, I stole these ideas from those people. So, and that's why I had the patience of four or five years to strive and create this thing. That's the honest truth. Okay, so now <clears throat> I'll tell you the story of Grameen Phone and I'll come back. So on one hand, we know the demand side that connectivity is productivity and productivity translates into an ability to pay. And on the supply side, prices cascading down. So somewhere between the supply side and the demand side would intersect. But the problem is, as I try to do it, many people, well-meaning people, they said I was crazy, etc. So I felt there are a lot of misconceptions at the time. And I was trying to sort this out. So I wanted to go through it because the, some of those misconceptions might persist to this day. Okay. And one of them <clears throat> is that poor countries are under-resourced. So therefore, you don't have the, the ability to buy these kind of things. At that time, by the way, right now, you can probably buy a cell phone for $20. But when I was doing this in early 1990s, they were expected to be $500. And in fact, that was the case. I went to all sorts of countries. I went to Nokia. They said, no, no, this is going to be $500, et cetera. This is no. And Bangladesh GDP was half of that at the time <laughs> per year. <laughs> so this is totally crazy. Okay. So I want to show you the, the typical. But I was simply looking at it through Adam Smith and Gordon Moore and said, it should work out. And one other point I'm trying to say is that if you want to solve a problem such as this, you, perhaps you should uh, steal ideas from these kind of people. Okay, and that might help. Okay, so anyway, <clears throat> so poor countries are un extremely. Um, so the main point is poor countries are very poor; they don't have the resources, so therefore they cannot buy it. it. Makes sense, but actually, I felt poor countries are very wasteful. The reason is I was wasting time. And I realized that if I had a phone or my computers worked, then I wouldn't be wasting time. So I was actually wasting time was the w another way to look at it. Because after all, uh, every country has 24 hours a day. Bangladesh has 24 hours a day. Denmark has 24 hours a day. Um, America has 24 hours a day. So on this resource, we're all equal. So if we are wasting more, Obviously, we'd fall behind Denmark or America or so whatever. So one way to look at it, yes, they don't have the resources. But the other way is to see it that if you are very wasteful, then obviously you'll fall behind. Okay? And how do we plug those holes? How do we stop those wastes is another, at least another way to look at it. And, uh, and after all, if something, so for example, Take, uh, I, I was, uh, let's say, I'm buying a car in America. I'm sure this is true in Denmark, too. That you buy a car, and well, we probably put nothing down. The, the man is happy to sell you a car. The car takes me to work. The work pays me a salary. And the salary uh, allows me to pay off the loan for the car. The car is actually paying for itself. OK. So the point is, if it is a, if it is a um, <clears throat> You don't quite need the buying power. If it's a productivity tool, the tool can pay for itself. And we can arrange a financing of it through a bank, through microcredit, or something. Okay. So the bottom line is tool leverages your energy. It, you have more money. You can pay for the loan. Then everybody's happy. The third misconception is that you need money to start making money. You need something to buy all for yourself. Again, the counter examples are all around us. So somebody needs a bank, banking service, doesn't mean he has to buy a bank himself. Somebody else buys a bank, 
and then I go to the bank and get my banking services. And it's a business for that person, but it's a service for me. So I don't have to buy a bank all by myself. So even if the phone is $500, which I cannot afford, let somebody else buy it and finance it and all that. Okay, and I can just go to the phone when I need it. Another important point is that um, people said, just this is crazy, digital latest telephone, that's not something to think about. There are food, clothing, shelter. These things are more important and more urgently necessary. Okay. And my point is, why do we need to worry about that? If people have more income, they can engage their brains what to do with that money. In fact, if they make money, they'll engage their brain even better. In fact, brains are one of those resources that is wasted. Uh, because everybody has one brain at, at the end of the day. Nobody has two, nobody has zero. And that is a highly democratically distributed resource that should be put to use. So what I'm saying is if people make money, they will decide whether they need to buy clothing with it, housing with it, whatever. All we need to do is think about how to raise people's income. So all of these I could sort out in my mind, and I realized that the best thing to do is look at what are the actual practical problems, not these concepts, because I was pretty sure it is going to work out. So the practical problem was that you need other infrastructures to bring new things. So for instance, in the West, the internet was spreading very fast in those days, 93, 94, around that time. And that's because people already had computers, they had modems, they had um, credit cards, all these things. So the internet, a new idea, could ride very quickly. Now, in a poor country, the real problem is not theirs, but the vicious cycle created by not having other things. Then a new idea cannot spread very easily. Okay? And that is the practical problem. And that's why I started noticing that in the rural areas, and I was determined to take it to the rural areas. You know, cell phones people have taken to big urban centers. And I thought if the Moore's Law play out, if Adam Smith play out, then it should go everywhere. And so therefore, the rural areas of Bangladesh was an interesting target where there was 100 million people without any phone whatsoever. So if you just multiply the kind of waste I went through for a day, it's millions of work days that is wasted. Okay, so now I said, what else is there? Well, somehow there are these microcredit programs. And that's when I started noticing, among other microcredit programs, Grameen Bank. And so I started talking to them, and I first said, you know, you should have all your branches managed through telecommunications. You will be managing your bank better. But they were not that interested because they have created an oper you know, a decentralized operation where they get a report a once in every week. And after all, this is a country that didn't have telephones, so therefore, at least not in the rural areas. And therefore, it's, um, they had to be decentralized. So they didn't want to introduce a new thing and change their programs. So I started looking. I wanted to capitalize on their existing infrastructure because they had 2 million borrowers, 1,000 branches throughout the rural areas. It would be a, a something to rely on to reach out to those distant places. So I started focusing on what is it they do. And this is what I came up with, that they are basically allowing a poor woman, typically a poor, a typically it's a woman, because over time they found the women manage money better. And then they, she borrows some money, gets into an income generating business, and then she pays off the loan. And a typical loan was a cow loan. Somebody borrows money to get a cow, the cow gives milk, she sells the milk in the village, and pay off the loan. So then my point was that you know a cell phone could be a cow because she could borrow some money from the bank and get a phone and sell the service in her village and pay off the loan. And indeed, so when I went to Professor Yunus and said, you know, this is a cell phone can be a cow, he thought uh, it's a little crazy but somewhat logical. So if you think if it can happen, then make it happen. So that's when I uh, created a company in America. I raised some little seed money and I flew around the world to 
assemble uh, the right kind of forces to create this company. And many, many telephone companies rejected me. But eventually, I managed to convince the Norwegian telephone company. And then several years later, a company came about. And then we had, at one time, there were 300,000 of these women selling um, phone services to 100 million people. Okay. And of course, and right now it has some 55 million subscribers. But there is a whole industry. There's a, like 110 million subs phones in the country. And, the, and again, the thing has really blossomed. It's a highly, highly profitable business, et cetera. Okay. And in fact, just last month, Boston Consulting Group, BCG, uh, reported that, that there is this surging consumer market no one saw coming. And you can see the picture. There's a rickshaw wallah, rickshaw puller who is taking a lot of goods. And those things are actually cell phones. Look at the, the picture, OK? I, it just caught my attention that they, there is a great deal of boost in consumer confidence and overall purchasing power. Perhaps they meant it's because of the cell phones. I don't know, OK? But what I'm saying is I just think it's interesting how actually it has turned around. And the GDP of the country has tripled, if not quadrupled, in the last 15, uh, 20 years. So yes, indeed, I personally think all that greater efficiency is being coming together because markets have expanded. People can coordinate with each other's activities. And millions of people, each advancing by some number of dollars, is adding up literally to billions of dollars. I, would, I could easily show that it's adding, Grameen Phone alone is adding some $20 billion to the GDP of the country per year. So here is another little thing. I got this last year. I was talking about this in Dagens Naringslev. In, 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 in Norway, OK, there is a, there is a um, uh, what is that? That they are going, the Telenor, first they came to Bangladesh. They didn't think about Asia at all. And then they went to many other Asian countries. And again, I couldn't quite read the Norwegian article, but they said I was the door opener to Asia. But what I'm getting at, at least they didn't make me the doorman. But I'm trying to show, bring an interesting point, not just, just show off these little articles. The interesting point is this is an interesting interlocking arrangement between the rich countries and the poor countries. The, what happens is that, that the rich world can bring technologies that empower people and poor countries can provide a, a, a market for it. So that's, that can create win-win situation. To, to be honest, I dare say, today Bangladesh provides more aid to Norway than Norway gives to Bangladesh, much more. Because there's millions of dollars going back in dividends to Norway. So whether you call it aid, I don't care. But the point is, it is the flow of finance through Bangladesh to Norway is bigger than the other way around. Now, I want to go to the, the average person is a great resource. It's another theme that I learned through this experience. So one is that <clears throat> I actually tried to learn. I didn't try to create this company through learning some interesting complex formulas in books and my master's degrees and whatever. I actually learned it from the common people. And I just want to show you some examples of that. And the, there are fundamental reasons for this. But that's my nature anyhow. And I showed you about the taxi drivers before. That they taught me that there is the desire to improve people's conditions exist in every human being. And if they're coming across the ocean to New York to work, then our duty is, if we want to do something, is to create economic opportunities in their village. They don't have to go this way. Okay? And that's really what I did. And so for example, I'll show you the overall experts. Experts told me they need food, clothing, shelter, all those things. But poor people told me that they need communications. Because I was riding the same planes in which, through which they were migrating to other countries, to, to Middle East, to Singapore, I was taking, and I was sitting with them, and I just wonder, what is it you need? They said they need communication. Without communication, they don't dare to go. 
because they want to keep in touch with their families. They want to send money. So they actually need communication. And to be honest, all the experts, no one said cell phones are necessary to be distributed. Now we have woken up to that problem. But at that time, it was a difficult thing to do. This is why I'm going through all these steps tediously, because you, you need to see if you are interested in, acting, in working in these areas, that we need to actually think clearly as opposed to believing in some theories out there. So there's another point. The poor people are unable to pay. So the people told me, make the service very, very low cost, or make it free. Make it free. That was told to me by many experts. Okay? So here's my point. One time, I then bought an apartment in Dhaka. I was living there with my mother and my wife. And we had a maid who could work inside the apartment. And she gave me a letter to mail to her mother. And so <clears throat> I said, sure, give me the letter. So I said, I'll mail it. And she said, but please don't put any stamps on it. Why? Isn't that strange? I said, I'll happily put some stamps. It's not very much. OK. And she said, please, please, don't put any stamps on it. So I became curious. What's the problem? OK. The reason is, what I learned then, is that if you don't put any stamps on it, then the post office records it, that this letter is going to so-and-so, she or he must, whoever the recipient is, must pay twice as much after it is delivered. Okay? As a result, the postman is forced to carry it all the way to the recipient. And if you don't put the, if you put a stamp on it, then the letter could be thrown away. And then <laughs> there is no assurance that they will get the letter. Do you see my point? So the point is, this lady taught, taught me that please don't put any stamps. She was going to get it free for him from me. Right, because I was put the stamp. But she would rather make her mother pay twice as much, infinitely larger than zero, okay, and ensure that there is a service. So not having a service is far more costly than, having no, than, than, than paying something for it. You see the puzzle? So here's another little thing I learned from this poor person. And then I realized, ah. I may, you know, I was unnecessarily in this puzzle that I have to provide the service for free. And if it is free, then there's going to be huge load on the network. The net, that needs infinitely larger network and impossible to bring the money for. Do you see my point? Because if you make it expensive, somewhat reasonable, then you don't have to invest as much initially. So this, is cre this solved a big problem in my mind because all the experts told me, make it virtually free. And then the economics would automatically load up the system very high, and I could not possibly create the thing. Okay, So I show you another one. People showed me that if I'm trying to convince telephone companies, they said I must have a market research done. Now, a respectable market research would cost a quarter million dollars. And I, I had raised $100,000 to fly around the world and to convince people. Now, I cannot raise that kind of money. Bangladesh, nobody wants to invest. Some telephone companies told me they don't want to go to Bangladesh because there is, they are not a Red Cross, all these things. Okay? But the point is, I needed at least a, some $200,000 or something, maybe $100,000 to get a research done. But I don't have the money. So anyway, I was going back and forth. So one time, I was about to leave my apartment and go to the airport and go to New York. I'm trying to balance both worlds. And my mother said, Call me as soon as you get there. I said, sure. But as I got into the taxi to go to the airport, I was thinking, why did she say that to me? That call me as soon as you get there. Because 20 years earlier, I went to America when I was 18. And she learned that I got there after about a month. Because I traveled a little bit through the Europe. And then I went to America. I wrote a letter. She got the letter. It took three, four weeks. And now, after I'm 20, twice as old, and I have US green card, citizenship, whatever, credit cards, I am unlikely to get lost now. But she's saying, <laughs> call me as soon as you get there. What is the reason? She's your mother. What? She's your mother. No, because I was, she was my mother even then, 20 years earlier. Now I can. 
So what I'm saying is, forget about this market research. If something is happening, if something is already there, when you can, you think differently. You see my point? And the market research people told me that they will look at the GDP of per person, per village, and they will determine how many televisions are there, how, and there is no television because there is no electricity. My point is, they would have a totally counterproductive process. But if you create it somehow, there is a market. So I, all I'm trying to say, the experts, I mean, I know many of us are trying to be experts, but let us not count too much on that. What we need to do is think. In the first world, we often listen to customers. But this is the same problem. And the, because we underestimate poor people, we don't listen to them because we are the experts. We're trying to, but actually they are giving you a lot of information. So I want to read you this Henry Ford's little paragraph. It's kind of funny and interesting. Henry Ford wrote this book about his work and life. And I found this later on, much later, but it really resonated with me. He said, I do not recall anyone who said that the gasoline-based internal combustion engine could ever have more than a limited use. Every, all people demonstrated conclusively that the engine could not compete with steam. At the time, they were thinking steam engine will run these cars. That is the way the wise people, they know just why something cannot be done. They always know the limitation. That is why I never employ an expert in full bloom. If ever I wanted to kill opposition, means competition, by unfair means, I would endow the opposition with experts. They would have so much good advice that I could be sure that they would do little work. <laughs> and, and, and frankly, I'm not trying to disparage experts. All I'm trying to say is that we need to think clearly about what is it we need to do. And so I have a point about this, is that experts make models in their minds and then the models cage them. We all do. We make models, then we think through the model. But one thing good about the average person, he doesn't know these models, or he or she. And therefore, he or she ends up showing us the reality as they unfold. And this is why it's, they have a fundamental advantage over the experts. Because they're facing reality, they're showing it, and then uh, you can learn from it. So what I'm trying to say is that if you or anyone else want to do something, you have to actually live in the midst of these custom, uh, customers and learn from them how they're thinking because they're facing their problems that may not be captured by experts, existing experts. So, so that, those are my three themes. One is that dispersion is good. Another is connectivity, more connectivity the better. And also the average person is a tremendous resource. By the way, I must also remind you that when somebody is making a product or a service at a lower cost that is, advisable, that is consumable by a lower income person, you are helping the whole society because you're producing a product that is at a lower cost, which means you're releasing resources for the rest of the economy because you've just innovated in some new ways. So they're actually a tremendous resource for the society as a whole. We are constantly thinking how we can help poor people. We don't think how poor people are helping us. And actually they are in many, 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 many ways. And they are not as vocal as, as to as make that assertion. So now I want to show you how new kinds, of, now that cell phones have spread globally, billions of computers, these are all computers, are out there. Okay, there, is, there are many other new things are happening. Like for example, we have Uber. Do you have Uber here? Okay, so Uber, in many other Ubers are taking place in other countries, okay? Because they too have cell phones. There is a somewhat of a parity between the first world and the third world vis-a-vis -vis cell phones. And that's because I think fundamental, th it has touched on fundamental parts of human nature, connectivity. Is, is very, very uh, intuitively appreciated for a long, long time. So I give you a very quick run. So for example, here is a company that uh, you can buy bus tickets in Bangladesh through this shahoj.com. Here is something you can lease, if, uh, uh, what is that, if solar panels very cheaply 
cheaply in the sense that you don't have to pay fixed installments. You can pay whatever you want. If after it runs out, the amount you have paid, it shuts down the solar panel. And then you go fill up more money, then it goes again. So it's flexible, no one has to collect the lease payments, etc. Here is a Uber type thing, taxi service by motorbike. It's called Safe Boda, but I don't think it's that safe. But, but anyway, it's a motorbike uh, taxi service in Kampala. Here is, a, here is a courier service in, you can send a package across town in Nairobi. And again, motorbike ones. But again, it's another kind of organization coming out of this. Here is um, a, you can check if the medicine is counterfeit by, by this survey called, um, by this mechanism called M pedigree. By the way, you saw my student doing the survey in the beginning. That's another one. Here is uh, one that you, it can trace agricultural products and supplies in the, uh, in the, um, you know, through this company called Source Trace. This one, journalists can put, uh, put their articles about local events and consumers can uh, watch it. And to the extent how many people are watching a particular news item, the journalists are paid. So it's basically a platform where consumers and suppliers of news come together. The same thing about music here. Here is Bridge International, which has this, um, uh, which can help uh, the, the, in Nairobi slums, these schools exist. You might have heard about it. You pay like five to six dollars a month, and uh, children get pretty good education. And it's it, it's expanding very rapidly in Kenya and then on to Tanzania. And here is Bcash, which is a mobile money project, uh, in which I'm directly involved, and my brother is the CEO, and we just have 19 million subscribers, whereby you can send money from one person to another within seconds. Okay, so this one is movement of money. The other is a movement of goods and people and other things. So I, I want to show you a video. Um, Michael, how am I doing with time? I'm okay? Uh, seven minutes. Okay, so we'll, I'll be done on time. So let's look at this. What happened? This, by the way, just one week ago, there was an employee appreciation night in this big cash company. And this is a thank you to the employees. This is the governor of Bangladesh, Bank, the central bank, who gave the license. And sometimes there is Bengali. There is, I'll try to translate. So I just want, I have only two, three more slides. One point is, why is digital potentially pivotal? And I want to kind of summarize the points. One is that it is like this picture shows that they expect smartphones to be owned by 80% of the world's population, adult population, not just to the first world, but worldwide. Because of those fundamental reasons, they're spreading. And this also means people have, bil there are billions of computers now in poor countries in ordinary people's hands, in the average person I was talking about. And they're connecting, and it's dispersing, and they're connecting. And so because connectivity is fundamental matter, the mobiles transform in many ways. And it's not just I can call, I can text, I can send videos. There are many, many dimensions to this. So the impact is just profound. And then they make better use of limited infrastructure. So if I, in the past, let's say the roads were bad, but people would travel along them just to send the information. Now, they don't have to send the information. They can only go on the road when somebody actually has to move or a good has to move. So it makes a better use of the infrastructure that already exists. Third, they are, in, they are interactive. So kids, kids, by the way, learn very fast. But people in general can learn. So they don't have to be trained externally. So that's another reason this can be very impactful. Fourth, they raise income because they are, uh, they are making you more efficient. So many other things that may not fall in price, like this technology, can then be purchased. So for example, let's say a generator that may not be going down in price. 
But because, so there is still, this can be the foundation through which these countries can turn around and they can buy things with the additional income, things that they couldn't otherwise afford. So I do think not everything has to work out to the same extent as mobile phones. And, and they're already around. So all these reasons is why I think it can be pivotal. And what should governments do? I, in my mind, the governments should facilitate purchase of smartphones, which are compu full computers, because then they can bypass even the big telephone companies and <clears throat> help entrepreneurs build apps. And um, they can get education to build apps, but it is self-teaching anyway. And the governments can also create venture capital to allow those entrepreneurs to create those things and also create a backbone network for hotspots. What I'm trying to say is that cell phones have one small problem. That is, they are con the big telephone companies, if they're, they have to rely on that connection, then you don't have quite the freedom that the internet provides. In fact, in my mind, that is an existing problem. I mean, I've been saying all positive things about cell phones. But in my mind, there is one negative thing. Precisely because they have been so successful in all developing countries, the mobile phone companies are the largest company. They have enormous power, economic and otherwise. And as a result, it's, it's important that they, if they dominate the economies, the entrepreneurs cannot quite come up. And this is why the smartphones would allow you that, because smartphones are based on the internet. They can go around. And so small entrepreneurs can create services. So, so if, another way that the governments can do is to limit their, um, so that, for example, in several countries, uh, mobile phone companies have banking services. And that's, uh, in my view, is not a good thing. Because they simply have the technology, and the banks may not be as sophisticated technologically. And then they, the mobile, fo mobile phone companies become, let's say, owner of banking services. But the central bank does not regulate, for instance, the telephone companies. They will create potentially many more problems. So this encroachment into new areas needs to be watched carefully. And there are actually many other problems with that, but that's one. But in many countries, it has already happened because people didn't quite see or understand. So I, I want to just, this is my last slide. There, there is a, I, I want to show you that the three points I made are actually, it's not incoherent three points. They're all deeply connected, and they all simply reflect the different phases of progress. One is that people tend to disperse economically as they pursue their self-interest. Because I want to do this, you want to do that, etc. So it automatically dispersion happens out of self-interest as they are empowered technologically. And in that pursuit of self-interest, they also want to connect and cooperate. That's why I showed you the Adam Smith point. And of course, the average person being able to do that in pursuing those things is, pro is progress. So those three points I made are actually deeply connected faces of the same thing. And that's all my presentations. Thank you very much.